Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. God sent his son, who is the rock of our salvation, Let's sing this morning, The Solid Rock. Let's join together all our praise, all the truth, all the reality of worship to our God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's sing.
steadfast. Our text this morning comes from uh, 1 Kings chapter number 18. We're in the last paragraph of that text. Uh, before we get started with our sermon, I want to welcome Daniel and uh, Ashley and Mary. They are some of our mission partners. We have supported Ashley uh, for a number of years, and she has worked with Encompass World Partners, uh, serving overseas, ministering to refugee families in other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, uh, Daniel and, and Ashley, their time has come to an end with Encompass World Partners, and uh, they're in transitional ministry, looking for new mission partnerships and new mission direction. Uh, in the meantime, they've got an opportunity to stay here at our mission house. So they're going to be at our mission house for a couple months to kind of uh, figure out what's next. We're talking with them about some ways that we can continue helping. Uh, but Ashley is the brother of one of our deacons, Landon House, and so they're here today. And so we're, we're glad to have y'all, and I uh, hope you feel welcome at least for the next several weeks to months, however long you're here, and Lord bless you, and glad to have you with us uh, this morning. You'll actually get a chance to hear from them in a couple weeks on Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but the week after. They'll share a little bit more about what they've been doing and what God's doing in their lives and in their ministry. So I've entitled this morning's message, Power, Privilege, and Persistent Prayer. And of course, the paragraph we're going to read in 1 Kings 18, 41 through 46, comes right after the story of God raining down fire to, to lick up that offering that was on the altar uh, that Elijah brought before the Lord. It, it follows the confrontation between Ahab and Elijah. And as I put the title together, I was thinking about the concept of power and the concept of privilege, right? And that, that fits very nicely with Ahab. He's a man of power and privilege. He's the king. He can do whatever he wanted to do. And in many ways, over the course of his kingly tenure, he did do whatever he wanted to do. He acted in discord. He acted in, in rebellion. He acted in idolatry. He acted in murder. I mean, he was not a great king. So he functioned with power. And, and, and why did he do that? Because he had all the privilege to be able to do that. And in some ways, what we're going to see in this text is a contrast between the power and the privilege that Ahab had as king and the prayerfulness of Elijah in the text. But even though there is a contrast between Ahab and Elijah, and we're going to bear that out in this text, one of the things I want us to understand is that real power and real privilege do not come to us by way of kingly thrones or financial security or blessings and privileges in the world. Real power and real privilege come to us by entering the presence of a holy and a great and a glorious God. Really, in this text, the only person who truly had power and privilege was the one connected to God himself, which was Elijah. Read with me, if you will, in 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 41. Right after the confrontation, right after the death of Baal's prophets, Right after God showed out gloriously, here's what happened. Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is the sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth, and he put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked, and he said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and with wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. This is a, a glorious paragraph of contrast. After the confrontation there on the mountain, Elijah looked at Ahab and said, Go up. Go ahead and have your meal. Haven't eaten all day? Go eat. Now, he could have invited Ahab to repent. He could have invited Ahab to pray because he was going to pray. But that's not what happened because Elijah knew what was in the heart of Ahab. Ahab wasn't in a place to repent. He wasn't in a place to surrender. So here's what happened. Ahab went up to party, 
And Elijah went up on the mountain to pray. That's the start of the contrast. Uh, this picture where, where Elijah is focusing on his relationship with God, Ahab is focusing on his own self-sustenance. He wants to make sure he is taken care of. Oh, by the way, there's no problem with eating a meal. No problem at all. We did that just this morning with our, 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 our monthly mission breakfast hosted by Baptist men. There's nothing wrong with you going home and eating a, a wonderful lunch. There's nothing wrong with having parties and having celebrations. But this was not the time for a party. This was not the time for a celebration. This was a time for national repentance. This was a time for a recognition that the gods that had been worshipped were not the gods that were real. This is a time for the people of Israel who had said, the Lord is God, the Lord is God, to draw the heart of their king to surrender and worship to the one God who was. But that's not what Ahab did. He took care of himself rather than seeking a right relationship with God. Elijah models for us in, in this indication someone who is humble and someone who is focused on God himself. And by the way, that's the nature of the gospel. The nature of the gospel is that you and I need God regardless of what has gone on in our lives, victoriously, or by way of failure and struggle. We need God. And, and so Elijah, what he does in this text, he shows us and models for us some principles for effectual prayer. If you and I want to talk to God in a way that we can see God at work in our lives, Elijah shows us by example, here's what that looks like. The primary key to effectual prayer, though, is this. It's humble desperation. That's the primary key. That is the most important thing that we could ever get from this is humble desperation. Why? Because that, it, that, that's the gospel. It, listen, let me put it this way. When we go to God knowing that we can't do anything to earn our salvation or to gain our own righteousness, what, what did your salvation experience look like? If it looked anything like mine, it looked like an admission of absolute helplessness and hopelessness. I can't do anything. I need God to do something for me. And you know what I did when I, that really came home to me? I repented of my sins and God saved me and, and forgave me and redeemed me. I was in a place of desperation. And that place of desperation brought me to my needs in humility. And do you know what God does when we come to Him in humble desperation? He invites us to receive salvation and forgiveness and grace and mercy and all the wonderful things that we desire. And what we see in the text is exactly what, what Elijah did. Now, now notice this. It, it, there had just been a massive victory. Elijah had prayed. And, and he had been there all day. I mean, it was hours and hours and hours that Baal's prophets kind of sang and danced and, and did all their stuff. And then it was probably another hour or two in Elijah getting prepared for, for his altar. And then God answering. And then the prophets being slaughtered. And, and, and this has been a long day. But do you know what Elijah did at the end of that long day? Folks, he didn't feast in celebration, though that would have been appropriate. He didn't gloat in victory, though that would have been understandable. And he didn't pass out in exhaustion, though that would have been expected. Instead, he went back up on the mountain and he prayed. Even after a glorious victory. Why? Because he was desperately humble. He recognized that the only way anything was going to happen that brought about the glory of God was not that he was going to do it. It was going to have to be God doing that. And in that desperate humility that he had, he gives us five principles for effectual prayer that I, I, I hope and, 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 and seek God in, in my prayer time this week and, and in this sermon. I hope we will put these into practice in our own lives. Principle number one is this. Our prayers should be based on God's promises. Why did Elijah go back up the mountain to pray after the event on Carmel, the confrontation? Well, what did he say in the beginning of the chapter? He told Ahab it's going to rain. And then God orchestrated the entire confrontation and the setup for God to show himself glorious and faithful. And so God had said it wasn't going to rain, it hadn't rained for three and a half years. God had said it was going to rain. And so why did Elijah go back up on the mountain? He went back up on the mountain to look out across the Mediterranean Sea, actually he sent a servant to do that seven times, we find in the text, to anticipate the rain that God was going to send. He, he told Ahab, go up and eat. I hear the sound of, of the rushing of, uh, uh, of rain. 
in, in my ears. And I'm not entirely sure that was a, a natural phenomenon. It might have been a supernatural kind of inference that Elijah had because of the moment and the situation. Or even if it was entirely natural, where, where he heard the rushing wind, the sound of a rushing wind, and he anticipated rain was coming. In any case, here's what Elijah did. He went back up on the mountain to pray. I want you to notice something that's about, uh, about this principle. It, our prayers cannot be based solely on our needs. We're not the starting point for our prayers. And that's where so many of us get out of kilter in our prayer lives. God's promises are the starting point for our prayers. Here's the reality. God speaks and we respond. God promises and we pray. Our responsibility is to take God at His word and go to God with His word and say, God, here's what you said. I trust you. Now, a word of clarification is necessary because if you read through the pages of Scripture, you're going to find a whole lot of promises. Many of God's promises in the Bible are context-specific or person-specific. For example, in Elijah's case, God promised him uh, it's not going to rain for three years and then it's going to rain. God hasn't made that direct promise to you and to me. Those are not promises that you and I should take back to God in our prayer lives and claim, okay, God, our nation is living in abject ungodliness and wickedness. I'm going to pray that it stops raining in our country and the agricultural life of our country ends. I'm going to pray that. Talmadge Mathis would not want us to pray that prayer, regardless of the wickedness and depravity in our country and in our world. But, but that's not a particular promise that God has given to you and me to claim. And so when we read through the pages of Scripture, one of the things that you and I need to do wisely is interpret those promises to see which ones are universal and principle-specific that you and I can claim. Because there are a lot of those. Commit your way to the Lord and He will bring it to pass. Seek first the kingdom of God and he will, he will meet all of the needs that He knows that you have. My God shall supply all your need according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. There are so many promises in God's Word that are not context specific. And guess what? They should be the driving factors in our prayer. God's promises should undergird and deepen our prayer lives. You want a prayer life where God answers your prayers? Pray the promises of God. Some might ask, if God's made a promise, why should I pray it? Because isn't God bound to keep the promise that, that He makes? Author and theologian A.W. Pink put it this way, why then should He now, that's Elijah, be found earnestly begging God for rain? To natural reason, a divine assurance of anything seems to render asking for it unnecessary. Would not God make good His word and send the rain irrespective of further prayer? Not so did Elijah reason, nor should we. So far from God's promises being designed to exempt us from making application to the throne of grace, for the blessings guaranteed, they are designed to instruct us what things to ask for and to encourage us to ask for them believingly that we may have their fulfillment to ourselves. God's thoughts and ways are ever the opposite of ours and infinitely superior. Our prayers should be based on the promises of God. Beloved, let me encourage you to read through the pages of Scripture and when you come across a promise that is universal and for any one of us, pray it. Take God at His word, pray His promises. Let me give you a second principle that, uh, that also depicts humble desperation. Uh, it is the principle of this, our prayers should embrace a posture of humility. Posture of humility. Uh, notice what, what Elijah did. He, he fell on his, on his face. He, laid, he, he knelt down and he put his face in between his knees. It's a, it's a posture of, of, of acknowledgement of who is Lord and who is God. And it's not Elijah. Now I want you to notice something. The quality and successfulness of our prayers depend completely on God's greatness and His grace, not on our goodness and righteousness. The only righteousness that plays a part in our prayer lives is righteousness from the outside. It's God's righteousness through Jesus Christ. We could call it alien righteousness. That is righteousness that God gives to us. Let me say something. No matter what we do when we come to God in prayer, we cannot and must not come to God in prayer because we think we've done something good this week or something good this day or something good last month or, or even our, our posture 
God doesn't hear us because we stand or kneel or, or because we, we hold our hands up or put our hands down or bow our heads or, or close our eyes. The, the posture itself does not make God give us attention. But here's the reality. Our posture oftentimes acknowledges what's going on in our hearts. The reason Elijah knelt as he did is because he recognized after that glorious set of experiences for three years and after that wonderful confrontation on the mountain and after that powerful day, he realized that the only thing he had done is put an altar together and pray. Who won the victory? God did. Who kept the promise? God did. Who was going to bring rain? God was. And so what was Elijah going to do? All he was simply going to do was pray. And he bowed before God in a posture of humility. His posture in the text is gloriously interesting. In fact, it, it, is, uh, it is instructive to us. Just a few minutes before, a few hours before, he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with King Ahab, straight as an arrow, powerful, in charge, in control, knowing what God was going to do. He, he, he dismissed and, and executed the prophets of Baal. His posture in the previous moments and minutes was one of activity. And yet what we find in this moment is his posture was one of absolute humility. He knew where power came from. He knew who God was. Folks, his posture reflected his humility. There are some times that the best thing you and I can do is get alone where nobody else is going to see us and get on our knees or get on our face before God and acknowledge that He alone is in control. Why? Because, folks, if we're going to be desperately humble, sometimes our body ought to show it. Sometimes our knees ought to bend so that there's a true reality that the nature and the posture of our heart is bowed in surrender to God Himself. Let me give you a third principle that's found in the text. Our prayers should be defined by persistence. Persistence. Elijah asked for a very specific thing. That's not a principle in the text. But he asked specifically, God send rain based on God's promises. The, you will get better answers to your prayers the more specific you pray your prayers. And, and then Elijah prayed persistently. Did you catch that? He had a servant with him and he told his servant seven times, go look and see if there's a cloud in the sky. I'm praying for rain. God's promised rain. God's already answered with fire today. So he answered with fire and water in the same day. Doesn't that show you that God is gloriously in control over all things in nature? He is, he is Lord of lords and King of kings, just like we've already sung today, just like we've already acknowledged today. And, and so Elijah bowed down and he prayed and he sent his servant and his servant looked and there was nothing in the sky. He kept praying, he sent the servant again, he looked, and there was nothing in the sky. He kept praying, he, he sent his servant to look, and there was nothing in the sky. Seven times he sent him to, to make sure that, 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 it, 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 that, there was a, that there was a cloud in the sky because he knew that rain was on the way. Seven times. Sometimes we wonder about that. You know, why does it take so long for God to apparently answer the questions that we have in our hearts and the prayers that we pray from our lips? Let me remind you of a couple of things. God is always on time with his answers, but he's never in a hurry. God's never off. His timing is never off. His answers are never off, but they're not on our timeline. Time we tend to be in a hurry. God's not in a hurry. He knows exactly what He's doing. And God's delays in answering our prayers are designed to teach us to depend on Him. You should think about that. It, that Elijah had to pray over and over again for the very same thing was teaching Elijah over and over again that he needed to depend on Him. And strangely, we would think that Elijah had already learned that lesson. I mean, he, he had to receive food by the ravens morning and evening at Cherith. He had to travel all those miles to Zarephath and rely on a widow and rely on God's miraculous intervention so that the widow would have enough food to feed him for the two plus years or so that he was there at Zarephath. I mean, Elijah had a pattern of depending on the Lord and God answering miraculously. And yet still in this moment, Elijah prayed and had to pray persistently in order to get the answer from God that, that he was praying. Now that ought to encourage us. Just think about this for a second. If Elijah 
still had to pray over and over again for that thing that was on his heart and that promise that he knew God had made. If Elijah had to pray that way, then guess what? We do too. Don't lose heart. Don't stop praying the promises of God. Don't quit praying for that family member, neighbor, child, grandchild, son, daughter. Don't stop praying for them. Don't stop praying for those around you. Why do we need to pray persistently? Because the persistence of prayer acknowledges the key to effectual prayer, humble desperation. When you and I bow, moment by moment, minute by minute, hour by hour, consistently, regularly, often, when we bow, it acknowledges to God and to ourselves that we realize where the answer comes from. And it's not from within. And it's not from a person, but it's from God Himself. It reflects a humble desperation. Let me give you a fourth principle that Elijah lays out for us in the text. Our prayers should lead to power for our mission. for Whatever God has called us to do. Did you notice what, what took place there on the mountain? He, 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 finally, they, the, the, the servant saw that there was a cloud in the sky. And as soon as the servant came back and said there's a cloud, Elijah got up because he knew that God had answered his prayers. He knew that God was sending rain. And he told the servant, go tell Ahab, get in your chariot and you better get to Jezreel because the valley that, by the way, that, uh, that, overlooks, that Jezreel overlooks is the valley of Megiddo. Same valley that you'll read about later on in the book of Revelation. Same, same kind of a uh, uh, place that, that overlooks it. And, and it was notorious for when there was a whole lot of rain, there would be muddied, uh, the, uh, it would muddy up the tires of chariots. So basically it was saying, Ahab, hey, you better leave. You better get off the mountain and you better get to Jezreel because if you don't get there in time, your chariot's going to be mucked up and going to stop up. And so Ahab did that. Interestingly enough, uh, Ahab on two occasions, even though they weren't good things, he listened to the prophet. He went up and he ate and he left the mountain at the prophet's command, who was really in charge. It wasn't Ahab uh, in, in that instance. If only Ahab had repented, he hadn't. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. But then you notice what, what Elijah did. He took his robe, he girded up his robe, which is basically he took it between his legs and he made himself a pair of shorts. He tucked it in his, his belt and he ran. He ran from the top of Mount Carmel to uh, the, the palace gates or the, the, the house that, that Ahab had, had, uh, had, was staying in there in Jezreel, not Samaria's palace, but the, the other house where Ahab stayed in. And he ran there from the top of the mountain. And the text says that he beat the chariot there. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never outrun a horse a day in my life. I've been on a horse before. I've fallen off of a horse before. I've, I've had to hold on to a horse so that I wouldn't fall off before. Horses are way faster than people are, even pulling a chariot. And yet, a, a Elijah outran the chariot. Depending on where he was on Mount Carmel and where exactly uh, the house was in Jezreel, it was anywhere between 13 and 17 miles. Now, I've run a half marathon before, several of them. I enjoy running. It's my stress relief. But I don't run a half marathon very fast. Okay? I've completed it. But that's a several hour run. In my case. I mean, the fastest runners in the world beat that time by a lot. Fastest runners in the world run a marathon in two, mi two hours. I don't know that Elijah was the fastest, it was a marathon runner. But he, he got there before the chariot got there. I want you to think about this. After an entire day on the mountain, after the confrontation and the battle with the prophets of Baal, after the execution of the prophets of Baal, after praying on the mountain, Elijah outran a horse and a chariot. How in the world did that happen? There's a phrase there that tells us, the hand of the Lord was upon him. Folks, there are some things in our lives that you and I are strong enough for. But there are other things in our lives. Situations, circumstances, challenges, opportunities, mission expectations, that quite frankly, we're not strong enough for. 
You, it, it, there have been times in my life where I can honestly look back and say, I don't know how I got through that. My wife and I have reflected on some times in our lives as a family and as a couple where I'm not entirely sure how we got through that season. I don't, I don't know. When I look back and I think about all that was going on, <laughs> it must have been divine empowerment. Did you notice that phrase, the hand of the Lord was upon him? I have no idea what's next for you or what's next for me in terms of reality. I don't don't know. I don't know what's coming down the road. I I don't know what was... Elijah didn't know what was coming down the road for him. He's going to find out in chapter 19. And there's some serious struggle that was going on in his life then. But what I do know is this. The only way we will receive the divine empowerment that we absolutely need is if we bow before the Lord in humble desperation. You realize the only people that God puts his hand upon are those who bow before him in humble desperation? It's not about talent or skill or 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 what you think you provide or what you do provide. It's not those things are largely irrelevant to God. He can use anyone and everyone. That's the glory of God and his greatness. But who does he put his hand upon? Those who are desperately humble. I don't know about you but I want God's hand upon me and upon His work in our world. So we need to seek Him. Martin Luther understood this principle. The, great, the, the man God used greatly in the Reformation era, and he was flawed and full of problems doctrinally and practically, but God used him in mighty ways to bring about the Protestant Reformation. And, and Martin Luther testified to this. He said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours of my day in prayer. Luther understood that the power that he needed was not from himself. It wasn't, he he didn't need more study or more energy. He didn't need more effort. He didn't need more wisdom or more sermons. Although all of those things God used in his life, what he needed was God. So he spent time in prayer to make sure he had God because if he didn't have God, he didn't have anything. He needed divine empowerment. That's what we need. We see this in the New Testament. That's exactly what happened in the book of Acts. Jesus said to his his disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you know what they did? They waited in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit fell. It's not that they were being disobedient to the Great Commission. They were waiting on the power to do the Great Commission. And the Holy Spirit fell. What do you find them doing the rest of the book of Acts? Preaching and teaching and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Folks, what we need desperately more than we need anything else is the hand of God upon us. Principle number five. Our prayers should provide a proper perspective for today's conduct and for tomorrow's activity. Elijah had looked back at the Mediterranean Sea and seen the cloud, the cloud of rain that was coming. He looked out across the valley of Jezreel and seen where where he was headed to. Now why in the world would he make pains to run ahead of the chariot? Scholars have wondered that. What was the point of that? Why did he need to do that? I'll be honest with you, one scholar put it this way, and I think he's right. Elijah saw himself as a servant of God and a servant of the kingdom. And he he was serving Israel. He, He wasn't being prophetic against Ahab and Jezebel because he hated Ahab and Jezebel. He did not want their deaths. I believe he wanted their repentance. I believe he wanted their changed hearts. Why did he run before Ahab to Jezreel? Because he wanted to be there to function as a spokesperson for what God had done on the mountain. He wasn't challenging Ahab in the sense of functioning in a disrespectful manner or trying to overthrow the kingdom. He wanted the king and he wanted Jezebel and he wanted the nation to move forward in repentance. Which is why I think he went there. That's what what I mean by having a perspective for today's conduct. What God wants for us is to be faithful in the moment. How are we going to know what to do? We need divine understanding. We need to pray. On top of that, that's not what happened. What Elijah longed for isn't what took place. Read ahead in chapter 19. Uh, Elijah's life didn't get easier. It got harder. The, The miracle on the mountain, God's intervention, did not result in national repentance. It resulted in in, uh, a king and a queen who grounded their feet in rebellion. 
and acted in wickedness. And I'm sure that in some ways that's part of the reason for Elijah's despair in chapter 19, his broken heart in chapter 19. Nevertheless, the prayer on the mountain gave Elijah direction for the ministry today and also perspective for what was to happen next. That's why we need to pray. We need humble desperation because we don't see everything that there is to see. You see, folks, see, folks hindsight is twenty twenty. We might be able to look back and see how God's led us or see a decision we made that was right or see a decision that we made that was wrong. But we are limited. We're limited. I'm not even fully aware of all that's going on in my life now, much less tomorrow or next week or next year. My perspective is limited, and so is yours. What does prayer let us do? It lets us get near the one whose perspective is unlimited. Folks, God knows and sees everything. We tend to act like we know enough to make all the decisions that are in front of us. And that's why praying, or not praying rather, is, is kind of indicative of a lot of times um, spiritual failure. Because it's like we're acting on what we think we know. What was Elijah acting on? He was acting on praying and seeking God. Humble desperation provides us an opportunity to get insight from the one who knows everything and knows everything all things, and it allows us to trust Him. Now, folks, what would have been fantastic to read in the book of 1 Kings is for the events at Carmel to give Ahab a backbone and for him to have gone up on the mountain with Elijah to pray rather than go out with his horde to party. That would have been fantastic. It would have been a great story to read. To go back to Jezreel or go back to Jezebel and, and divorce her and put her away and send her back home to mom and dad and say, listen, we're going to stop being idol worshipers. I watched God do something fantastic. The events of those events humbled me. Unfortunately, even national glories and things like this that God did don't always function to humble the people that are in charge. Sometimes they simply reveal the hardness of heart that's already present. Ahab continued to act and function independently of God and His glory. That's the exact opposite of humble desperation. Ahab thought he was in control. He thought he was in charge. But Elijah recognized who was really in charge. See, he models for us something that we desperately need. We need God. Now, I've preached on prayer before. I've preached on prayer several times before. And every time I preach on prayer, uh, I, I have a measure of, of uh, conviction. That I don't pray enough, and I don't pray well enough, and I don't pray faithful enough. And I think oftentimes that's the way we come at a, a, a sermon on prayer. Okay, pastors offered us five principles and, and I need to put those into practice and, and I need to do better. And I promise this week that I'm going to put at least one of those principles into practice and I'm going to do better. And if that's the way you hear this sermon, may I, may I lovingly tell you that is not the spirit in which this sermon is preached, nor is it really what we need. And here's why I say that. Because the purpose of us learning to pray as Elijah prayed is far less about the patterns and principles than it is about the heart and the spirit and the recognition that we, we need God. See, the contrast is this. Ahab decided, I'm going to do things the way I've always done things. Elijah recognized, I need God. Can I tell you something? If you realize you need God, you will pray. It won't be anything that you can do but that. And you'll pray in the car when you're driving. Please don't close your eyes in that moment. You'll pray on your knees in your closet at your home. You'll find a place at your office. You'll find quiet places. You'll find moments to pray. 
Why? Because you realize you need God. Ahab never recognized that he needed God. Listen, prayer doesn't provide a pathway to God. And what I mean by that is this. We can never, by the quality of our prayer life or the quality of our righteousness or our good deeds, get to God. That's not the gospel. The gospel is not how we make our way to God. The gospel is he came to us. Prayer is an opportunity for us to meet God in his glorious intervention in our space and in our world. In fact, prayer for us points to a greater prayer that was prayed and remained unanswered. On Mount Carmel, Elijah prayed that God would answer, and God answered by fire. But in a garden in Gethsemane, Jesus bowed on his knees before the Father. Do you remember the words that he used? He said, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. Do you recognize that God answered that, que- that prayer in the negative? God did not give the holiest of any person ever, the, one, the only one that could ever approach God in his own righteousness. Jesus prayed, Lord, if it's your will, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. You know what God's answer was? No. God answered Jesus, no, so we could have the privilege of prayer. See, because Jesus went to the cross... Because Jesus was willing to submit to the Father's will, because Jesus paid your price and paid my price on the cross, you and I have the privilege and the right and the opportunity to stand before God, to kneel before God, to cry before God, day after day, moment after moment, minute after minute, not on our own righteousness, but on the righteousness of God bought through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Prayer is indeed a privilege, and it is a costly privilege, but it is not something that costs us dearly. It costs our Lord dearly. Here's the way we're going to close this message. We all have an opportunity to respond in in a whole host of ways. When we come to God in His greatness and His glory, and we come to God in our need and our situations and our sufferings, we can either respond like Ahab, We can go party. We we can we can kind of check a box and say, Man, I heard a good sermon today and we we sang some good music and I really when I listened, I I really heard the congregation singing and it was so encouraging to hear somebody else sing and Sunday school was good and man that breakfast was good and, and we can check that box and say, I did the church thing, I was there, I'm good, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna eat lunch and I'm just gonna go about my business. I'm not saying you have to go home and make an hour to pray or you have to come to the altar and kneel to pray today. But I'm going to tell you, a lot of times what we do is we respond a whole lot more like Ahab. I got it. I heard. I listened. What I'm going to ask us to do is something different. To respond like Elijah responded to pray is to respond in humble desperation. I don't know whether today you need to come to the altar and bow on your knees and effectively in this worship service acknowledge your humility and your desperate situation before God. Maybe you absolutely do. Maybe when you get time at home later today, you need to shut everything off, turn everything, uh, turn everything out, set some quiet time, get on your knees before God and take your situation before Him. Maybe you need to make that a pattern, a more persistent pattern in your life. I... I'm telling you, though, when we see God in His greatness and see our situation, our response has got to be the humble desperation of someone who realizes we need God. Because, beloved, we need God far more than we ever think that we do. So will you hear a sermon like this and just go away to eat and drink? Will you ignore God and go back to your previous patterns and idolatry? Or will you look to God's promises and look to God and pray? Stand with me if you will. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.